I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm John Merchant. You'll hear an Aussie accent, so if I need to slow down, um, just tell me. I do speak English, or maybe we call it Australian. Um, uh, I'll explain a little bit about my background, because there's a lot of new faces here, which is great to see. Um, my background is actually, I describe myself normally as a hybrid. As a, I did a dual at university, in, a major in structural engineering and computer science. Um, you can see some of the examples of some of the projects I worked on, um, pretty spoil um, on project exposure. You'll recognise Wembley, uh, the 2012 velodrome, which I worked on when I actually came to London. A lot of the structural engineering was actually done in Sydney for the, um, for the roof and arch. Uh, a couple of footbridges, a couple of towers, um, lots of geometry, so hence uh, part of the uh, foundation of Geometry Gym. And I guess we, I work basically as a typical structural engineer on these jobs, but with a computer science degree, I was always writing scripts and spreadsheets to try and help me do my job. Um, and then eventually I let others, when I got to London in 2005, learn about Rhino. Actually, out of interest, how many guys here are Rhino and Grasshopper users? A few? Revit? Yeah, good, good mix. Um, okay, um, and yeah, so I started learning Rhino, started writing some Rhino plugins. And, uh, and they were helping me do my job. I started letting others in the office start using them. Eventually, Arab started trying them on a project, and when they became reliant enough on them that I could start charging them for it, I decided to have a crack at doing it full time. And that was about eight years ago. Um, and since I've basically been um, primarily developing tools um, in the forms of plugins for Grasshopper, Revit, um, um, Rhino, um, other structural software like Tecla. Uh, and mainly about interoperability. So often we have to build multiple models of the same thing and we can normally build a model once, but then we spend a lot of iterations changing and coordinating and updating models. Um, and so a lot of the emphasis on my work is actually, well, I've got an intelligent model in application A, how do I get that into intellig as an intelligent model into application B without doing a lot of tracing and, and mouse clicking to do so. Uh, uh, this presentation you might have noted, uh, Shape to Fabrication was on the last couple of days and Ed asked if I could replicate um, at least most of this today and I'm probably going to step back a little bit and just do some more simple introductions as part of it. Uh, and part of this thing was what is BIM? Um, well, I don't know, I'm not going to try and define it, but I guess there's two fundamentals that I consider BIM. One is digital information exchange and just because it's digital doesn't mean we can't just do our drawings in AutoCAD and take a photo and email that, it should be machine readable to some sense and, uh, in, in terms of uh, using that information downstream. Uh, I use this quote, this BIM thing, do I need to worry about it? And remember this was actually focused at a McNeil Rhino event and this is quoting Bob McNeil, um, which maybe says something about uh, McNeil's um, point on BIM and actually that still relates to the question above, is what is BIM? Um, because uh, if it's hard enough for me to define, it's probably even harder for Bob himself, who's an accountant. Um, I started searching about um, uh, well, what, what applications are involved in BIM, and some of these are maybe images taken from other presentations and things like that. And I mean, I'm sure you guys know, I don't know, I haven't asked how many applications you use in your projects here, but I'm imagining there's quite a vast variety and array of them. Um, and then that interoperability only becomes more and more important and we'll, I'll demonstrate some of these approaches I've taken to helping interoperability uh, um, shortly. And if we look, I guess, at where Rhino sits in this, then um, Rhino and Grasshopper basically sit as a platform. Uh, the amazing thing with Rhino and Grasshopper is it's used for designing jewellery and shoes and marine and uh, you could probably name it. Uh, it's quite a versatile industry agnostic geometry tools. Um, and then they basically encourage and support third party developers like me and a whole multitude of others. But so I'm particularly highlighting here uh, what you might identify as BIM plugins for Rhino and Grasshopper um, to pr provide the more specialist industry um, functionality. And then typically, most of those plugins then have some sort of interface into other more dominant and, and probably instantly recognizable BIM tools that we might use as architects or engineers. So, um, yeah. I did a bit of a roadshow presentation last year which I called Back to the Future BIM and um, I'm doing a little bit of that here in this case as well and what was interesting at Shape to Fabrication was about how many contractual um, requirements on projects there were still people basically taking maybe some fancy geometry, this is the infinity bridge up in northern England near uh, Middlesbrough over the River Tees, it's Stockton. Um, and how many projects were still basically 
taking a fancy Rhino model and then scheduling coordinates off it as a means of exchanging the set out. And uh, we did this project 10 years ago um, when I was sitting in the expedition offices, which were then at the time in near Oxford Circus. Um, and I mean, this, this bridge has a box girder. Um, it's tapering and changing in depth and width and the side inclines. It's actually going from one member at the extremes to two over the center. Um, I don't know how we would have tried to set this out um, in, in more conventional AutoCAD sections and, and, um, and elevations and things like that. And I think one of the things, I guess, with the expedition directors is they were actually quite um, or reasonably um, happy with taking on risk or perhaps um, deviating from the norm a little bit more than other firms. And uh, we actually sent the, the Rhino model as a set out to the fabricator and they had to build, I, I, I assume they used Tecla, uh, but they then converted that into whatever fabrication process they needed. And there are a few te trips and, t t you know, part of the thing is you've got different status of elements as the design evolves. So some things are issued for information, some for approval, some for construction. And even, I guess, we tried to be innovative and even just use things like line type um, names for showing status and um, using layers as a way of, of showing different plate thicknesses and things like that. And sorry, this, this example is fairly structural bias, but hopefully you can um, uh, appreciate how it might be applied to more architectural aspects, including facades and things like that. Um, this was pre-Grasshopper 10 years ago, or Grasshopper was just emerging. Uh, we had some monster spreadsheet, which effectively I managed, and that actually basically, I don't know, you won't, might not be able to read the strings and stuff, but uh, effectively it's actually concatenating a bunch of strings which basically made Rhino commands that we copied and pasted into the command prompt. So when we were creating all the section curves to then loft to give that box girder or the tapered arms and legs and things like that, um, we were driving all that from a spreadsheet, and that was also building it for the engineering purpose, a structural analysis model, and because we had one source creating the two different models, we knew we were coordinated between the two. And I guess this is early evolution, and, and these, these things eventually uh, evolved into grasshopper plugins and things like that, which are more akin to the, the, how we'd actually tackle this type of thing today. I didn't say the main span was 120 metres, so that m might give you an idea of scale. Um, and looking at just a, having looked at this Rhino model for a few years and then going to site at the fabricator's yard and seeing this thing at, at, in one-to-one -one scale was, um, was certainly pretty impressive. Um, so that was 10 years ago. And then what I'm sort of, I'm in Arab Sydney were generous enough to at least give me a couple of images or allow me to talk a little bit about the process that we might adopt today if we were tackling something maybe similar or maybe dissimilar. Um, and certainly now we have Grasshopper. I didn't ask how many Grasshopper users? Dynamo? Okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. But, you know, and it's 10 years on, let's hope we have evolved and actually got a better process than what we were doing, um, writing a spreadsheet to try and drive these things. So, um, and again, this is a, a slightly engineering, well, it is an engineering example, but, you know, you can set out then these Helix members in Grasshopper. Um, then for the purpose of engineering, we could actually build um, a centerline based model or actually mesh the surfaces and get a plate model for calculating how stiff or how stressed this bridge would be in its loaded states. And then eventually taking that model to Revit. So how do you actually get a documentation model? Um, and again, the tools to actually achieve warping non-planar um, objects and things like that that you actually really can't model from the Revit user interface, or at least not accurately or quickly. Um, and basically the, in these sort of situations, what the tools do is they automate processes like writing a SAT or DWG file and then inserting that into a symbol which you can then load into a project and place as an instance and then populate parameters and things on. So the tools don't have a magic wand to make Revit do things Revit can't do, but what they hopefully allow you to do is actually automate a process and generate, you know, basically scripting. Grasshop is really a visual programming language and then what that allows you to do is generate this type of object um, and then automate that process of getting that in Revit. And I guess if my business has one mantra or one philosophy, it's actually just trying to reduce people clicking mouse buttons um, to, to, to build these models and share these models, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are a couple of images of this. This is Lachlan's Line Bridge, which is in North Sydney. Um, it's, it's actually the tender is, has just been closed and I can't really say much more than that, um, knowing a little bit of, uh, about the state of it, but I think um, there'll be some public announcements on this bridge soon and it'll be probably a really interesting case study as well about um, explaining a bit better maybe this, this documentation and design exploration through to, through to fabrication. So 
Um, that was a project I talked a bit about at the Shape to Fabrication event. I, I'm going to just fly through this one quickly, but again, this was a Shape to Fabrication focus, and, and I did actually present this one at Shape to Fabrication two years ago, but this is a Snowheader project uh, in the Middle East, um, and quite an interesting um, Shape to Fabrication, that's for sure. Um, even the, uh, the, the facade detailing is actually quite interesting in itself in that there's a more conventional curtain wall system and then they've got these rolled pipes which are then flattened um, at particular places to allow um, light and, and views and, and things like that to be um, evident. Um, and this, uh, even this whole process about how do you actually take like a fingerprint type arrangement of, uh, of lines or cur cur curves and actually put that over a building envelope. So I actually want to learn a bit more about the actual tubing part of this job myself. There's a little bit of a couple of papers, but not many. But And again, there's a structural focus on this, but where my tools got involved in were the actual structural steel work that supports that cladding, uh, where there's absolutely no two pieces of steel that are the same shape. And uh, the way I got involved in this job, because actually the, the facade consultant in Germany had done all the modelling in Rhino and they'd used a combination of manual modelling and grasshopper and python to do this and it was really well organised and each assembly was on a, a nested set of layers and there was a whole bunch of metadata on the objects but someone posted to the grasshopper forum saying well how do I order steel from Rhino um, which is, is a, probably a pretty um, difficult task so eventually what I got involved in was helping with a, a, a grasshopper script which basically reverse engineered and detected, again, it, with new profiles and stuff by metadata, but it basically detected the orientation of an extrusion um, and then any cut planes at the end and then basically converting all this information into um, instructions to feed into Tecla, the same we'll see in a, Re in a Revit in a second, which then Tecla is very good at basically digital fabrication and numeric control instructions and things like that. So from Tecla, it is very easy to order a bunch of steel um, and plan the um, assembly and, and, and fabrication, etc., of it, installation of it. Um, I was in Africa at the time and it all went quiet for a few months and then they started sending me some site pictures like this and that means I'm no longer hiding in Africa because uh, fortunately it all seemed to fit together. Uh, what is Open BIM? Um, normally I ask a group as well and maybe you'll get sick of me asking you questions, but uh, who's used IFC or knows what industry foundation classes are? Who's been happy and really thrilled with using IFC? <laughs> okay. uh, IFC is, and we'll look at this in a second, is uh, it's a neutral open text format which effectively defines a database the same as Revit defines a database of objects and relationships and attributes and parameters and properties. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll study it a bit more in a second, but this is something that I used as a way of, um, of, of transferring data, particularly between Grasshopper and, and Revit. And let me just see, Rhino is running. Okay, so I'm going to quickly, I mean, there's a standard example I do which effectively generates a bunch of mullions and stuff like that. Apologies for you guys that have seen this before, but I think it starts to really um, quite quickly um, explain effectively how do we put a Grasshopper user interface onto Revit so that we can actually generate these Revit objects um, or it could be Archicad or um, other software with this approach uh, with, with, with what we want to do. So. I'm going to first of all just use some native um, grasshopper components to actually set out what I want to do with this, this mullion or facade. Um, and for those that don't know grasshopper, it's, as I said, it's basically a, gra a, a graphical programming language. And objects either collect data or they uh, perform some sort of calculation on data. So here I've just set out some points in the, in the Rhino viewport. And then if I want to fit a curve through those points, there's an interpolate curve component. And what Grasshopper enables you to do is actually recalculate when any of the inputs change. So if I start stretching and dragging around any of these points, is it's recalculating the, the resultant curve shape. Um, so the inputs are on the left-hand side, the outputs are on the right-hand side, and these include, in this case, characteristics such as the resulting curve, the length of the curve, and the domain we won't worry too much about today, but that, that's effectively a number um, domain running from the start to the end of the curve. Um, if I wanted to say place some uh, facade members on this curve, then what I could do is start to do, again still using native Grasshopper, is divide the curve up into a number of points. Grasshopper has a number of uh, interesting um, user interface controls and things like that, so a number slider 
allows you to drag the, the numeric value of a, 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 and that's changing the number of division points on that curve. We could have divided the curve by distance, so if we knew the spacing was every um, 800 mil or a meter or something like that, we could actually have divided it that way. There's an equivalent component. Um, and then you can see here, and I think this is where Grasshopper has really enabled non-computer geeks like me to actually start to program, because part of the hardest thing of programming is debugging and tracing your code, when, particularly when things don't work. If everything works great, if you've actually got a flaw in what you've done, then finding that flaw is normally where the, the frustrating and time-consuming part of it is. But what Grasshopper allows you to do, is, and apologies for everyone that knows Grasshopper, but it allows you to actually interrogate in real time say the output, so we can see the x, y coordinates of each, each point, and as a human we can try and start to troubleshoot this much more easily than typing code and then uh, and trying to run a debugger over the top when that code's running. Uh, I could then say strike a line off each of those division points, at the moment it's only a one mil um, length, and if I had to start to do something like add a, a tractor point, is that then I can start to do calculated values. So I could say, well, tell me the distance between that uh, attractor point and each of these division points, and why that into be the distance or the length. And then what you'll see is we get something that then responds to how close or how far away the element is from that particular point. I've probably got a few too many elements here, and we'll check my scale in a second, but I'll just slide this back a little bit. So. Um, so what that then allowed, so that's native grasshopper, and of course if we wanted to take this as our set out model into Revit, is that then what we could do is we could export to DWG, bring that into Revit, start picking lines and making columns or something on these objects, and then start rotating to get, if we actually want the web or flanges or something like that, um, um, parallel or uh, perpendicular to the, the base curve at that particular point. So what we're not going to do is that, and what I've been working on for sort of the last eight years is some components here that allow us to, um, to effectively create the same Revit concepts here in Grasshopper. So, and again, maybe I'll assume this is the steelwork, maybe supporting the facade or something like that. But so I'm just going to make a material here. Some of my inputs have right-click enumeration context, which can also be set by number, and you should recognize these en enumerations in in, uh, in Revit um, that you would pick from the user interface. Other things are set by other components or more primitive data such as strings and numbers and things like that. So I'm making a material. I have a component to actually have a, a built-in catalog library and this I'm working again at the moment at how you can actually more easily customize this library yourself. You can do it but there's some improved ways I'm working on. But so if I wanted a universal beam um, to be the shape and size of these elements is that then I could actually, and again I want to actually group these things a bit better, but I could pick the shape off that and then the dimensions and stuff are all stored in. And we'll talk a bit in a minute about hopefully an improvement coming very quickly about maybe streaming all your materials and families out of Revit into Grasshopper so that you can just pick them off by name and know that it's consistent with what you've already got in your Revit project. I should have said if anyone's got questions, am I going too fast? Was this, um, okay, good. All right, so we've got our material, um, but please interrupt me if you do want to ask a question. I've got my profile, I've got my material, and that allows me to make a column family or type here in Grasshopper. And then if I actually want to make instances of the columns, I've got a, a column component here where I can wire the type in, the line to be the axes. And then at the moment you can see I've got a global orientation for each of these columns. It's uh, you know what the default is if you put it into Revit. Uh, I don't like that, I want to have them all transverse or parallel to the, to the curve. So I actually have a tangent vector um, output from the divide curve component which I can wire into the orientation input and then it will automatically calculate all the rotation angles for you to get those columns around that, that, that line. Um, maybe we actually want them the other way, so I actually can say under the vector menu um, I want to take a, a cross product of each of those vectors with a, a Z vector and wire that into the orientation vector and then I've got the flanges um, being parallel to the curve at each of those locations rather than the, um, the, the web. Okay, so what it's not trying to do is do a live stream to Revit. Um, there's going to be, and it's that in, in part is just to keep Grasshopper as quick as possible. So if you're working on a real project there's going to be lots and lots of elements and I don't think live links, which uh, some of the other software uh, do offer, um, perform that well at scale. 
But and, and, uh, sorry, just before I go into that, then you can set parameters on the instances and types. You can override the material. You can start to set the mark and, and other attributes and things like that on this. So there's a whole bunch of other components um, that, that that add extra metadata or relationships. You can actually force it. You can set up stories. You can force it to host the object on a story. You can do some of these sorts of operations or or um, and requirements on these objects that when they're generated. And, and remember, the whole thing's parametric. So if I actually come back and actually start changing some of the inputs on these things. Um, it's recalculating and that's the benefit I, or the amazing thing really of Grasshopper. <coughs> if you can actually identify what the inputs are that are going to change, then you can quickly respond to those changes when they happen and that's why it's quite a, a powerful design exploration tool um, as part of this type of process. So when you actually want to communicate these objects with Revit, there's this, in Grasshopper there's this concept of baking. At the moment I can't select anything in, in Rhino. But if I actually came back, you know, I could do it with mine, but I'll just do it with the curve um, and actually choose to bake this with this fried egg button, then I actually do have a, a curve that exists in Rhino that I can select and modify and do whatever else. But that object's now lost its history or, or knowledge that it actually came from Grasshopper. So it doesn't respond to any changes that might happen in the Grasshopper script up thereafter. And so there's this same concept with my tools. It's actually using this IFC or Industry Foundation class as a way then of writing that database out as a set of a recipe or a set of instructions for Revit to build the equivalent concepts in Revit. So I have a purple fried egg button that I can then double click on this and what it's going to prompt me to do then is actually write that out as an IFC file. And I think one of the other benefits you get with this um, as, as part of this workflow, if you, if you, if you save all these um, IFC files over time you can actually have an audit or uh, go back and, and review what you actually sent from um, one, point, one, one day or week to the other. Um, and, and, and so that, that it actually is a benefit that can actually be derived from this. And I will save this um, Grasshopper script if anyone wants to mess around with this afterwards, they're more than welcome to have it. Um, okay, so when I've written that IFC script, then I can go to Revit. And what Revit has built into it, uh, Revit or Autodesk themselves, even though I guess they didn't originally do Revit, were one of the original members of the Interoperability Alliance that actually um, started to create IFC. And they have their own implementation which can open an IFC file or um, link an IFC file. But if this is a real project, and normally the Grasshopper script gets locked off at some point in time, and because you don't actually, the day before you issue for construction, want to nudge a slider and then have your whole design change. Um, so there's normally this, this transition where through your design exploration you want your parametrics and then you get to detailed design and hopefully the design's locked and you uh, want to just carry on modelling it in Revit as if someone had manually created that model at some point in time. So what I worked on and started this about five or six years ago is uh, effectively the ability to import IFC or update a project with IFC. So I've got my own implementation where I can click that, pick the IFC file that I just created and then click proceed. Now, if, if the materials and the profiles or the families were already loaded into the Revit project, it would use them. So you can actually use a naming convention that's consistent and then it would use your, um, your company families and things like that. If it can't find it, it will create the family for you and then you can obviously swap it out later on if you want to. And what I can do is also, you know, th there are native Revit objects. So I put a strong emphasis on trying to make a model that someone should be able to open that Revit file next year or next week and not necessarily tell if it was created by my plugin or by another Revit user. So, you know, and if you've tried IFC and tried importing or um, opening IFC in Revit, you get a lot of dumb static objects just because they don't write the IFC quite the way Autodesk expect it. But I think I've written a tool or a, a development which is a bit more um, um, capable of, of, of recognizing the intelligence when it is there in some shape or form in that IFC file. Just to quickly show, it's not just about creating a Revit model once. Um, it's about being then able to update and review that Revit model at some point in time. So if I actually um, come back and then make version 2 of this script, then what I can do is update that Revit model with, those, uh, with that new version. And if you have a look at the output and see these funny looking strings, it's storing a list of unique identifiers. The pl my plugin's managing a pool or multiple pools of them for you in the background. 
And if we click on an element in Revit, what we would see is that that unique identifier um, is being stored on that element. So when we go to update Revit with this new model, it's able to identify, well, what was what object previously? And then at least the typical scenario is it then moves and, and changes the endpoints or whatever of the element. So if you've actually done manual tagging or manual parameter editing on these objects, that should be preserved as long as it's not overridden by the data in the IFC file. So I can say import IFC, pick version 2, run, run this, and then what you would, won't see but it's happening in the background is it's actually moving all these columns into the um, new positions. But what it's also done, because I actually reduced the number of columns in this new version of the file, it's actually stored the obsolete and delete identifiers and then the Revit plugin then deletes those objects as part of that process. So it's trying to manage the changes or help you manage the changes as the project design evolves as part of that process. Any questions on that then? Or okay. So that's columns. You know, there's a whole bunch of components to create adaptive components to create walls and windows and um, even primitive geometry with extrusions and lofts and sweeps. Um, as I said, you can set parameters. Even I've started now to do things that you could actually set out your sheets and, and viewports and plans um, as part of that sort of process. Of course, you can do a lot of that from Dynamo and it's perhaps better suited there. Um, but yeah, it, you know, all this stuff's been developed by demand from users. So if you do get a chance to try it and test it and it doesn't do something you want, then you can also certainly um, take my contact details uh, and let me know and I can give some advice as to how quickly or, or perhaps not quickly that, that, that change could be implemented. Okay, so that's, that's the work I've been doing for about um, the last six years. And then what I was also then starting to present at um, Shape the Fabrication was, uh, and, who, and again, you might get sick of me asking you questions. Who used Flux? Uh, not too many. Okay, anyone un who, who understands the concept of Flux or what? It was, yeah, a few. Okay, anyway. So what I was showing was Grasshopper writing a file and then using that file as an input to Revit. Now what Flux as a, um, a pilot or a, a trailblazer did was actually provide the opportunity to effectively set up on a server, or their own web server in their case, a data key where you could basically push and pull data from. And the, the, the one downfall or where I think this has a huge advantage over the approach of files is if you have files, you have to worry about the version of the files and whether the person, if it's not you running straight grass off at a Revit, so you're sending maybe grids or levels to the engineers, you have to worry that they've actually got that file and used that as the latest version in what they're doing. Now, if we actually use a common data repository and actually write and read and write the data from that, you know if they're pointing at that data, you always get the latest version of that data. And what typically um, Flux was used for, and I think Speckle is now a, a PhD project by a guy called Dimitri at UCL or the Bartlett. And uh, he, he's basically, and part of the trouble with Flux, they actually stopped their servers about two months ago or a month ago, um, because I guess, well, anyway. But, but Speckle is an open source alternative, so um, part of the trouble with Flux now is there was a whole bunch of firms that built up workflows dependent on that. They decided there was no or more money in other areas and decided to stop. And so there's a whole bunch of people working, looking at that equivalent concept and how, how this could be adopted. And what Speckle works is, is an open source plugin uh, you might need some IT um, gurus to actually, if you want to host your own data on your own server, which I'm sure you guys have got, uh, but th what that means is it can never be taken or stopped on you, which is what happened with Flux. So the primary benefit is it's, I mean, again, I guess worst case scenario, for some reason Specklework's development stops and it doesn't have any more functionality added. Of course it's open source, so you could actually choose to build more functionality in-house if you have some programmers. Um, but it's an ability to actually host your own data, which a lot of cloud providers aren't allowing you to self-host, um, which I think is really key to actually Flux perhaps being um, a very useful and exciting tool as part of this workflow. Um, with, with, uh, with, with uh, Speckle, there is, um, or with Flux, most, most of the data actually pushed and pulled from those keys was quite primitive. So you might have a Grasshopper script and it basically set out the project you're working on and then you might actually write, say, the set out points or the lines or the numbers to these data keys. So quite primitive data, not particularly complex or sophisticated. And then typically use Dynamo to reassemble that data uh, 
and then use that dynamo as the gateway to create intelligent Revit objects to, to do that process. That works, and I suspect there'll be a lot of users that use Speckle for the same way with actually quite primitive data. Um, but the problem is that it's hard to build up that as a process across your company, across a whole bunch of different projects, because everyone's going to arrange and rearrange that data in a slightly different way. And what's been really interesting, because Flux always said, oh, we want to be BIM agnostic, not just Revit, um, and all these sorts of things, but they sort of danced for two or three years talking to me, and ne we never really found a way of doing this. But with Speckle and Dimitri, there was literally a few days' work that I did to refactor things a little bit. Um, and we got intelligent objects transferring really quickly. So what I'm using here is um, some components similar to the ones I was just showing to make columns and things like that to make some grids. So I've got grid one and two here and I've got grid A here. And so I've got some components here that simply take a set out curve or line and take a grid name. And what that's doing then is actually now storing that data on a web server somewhere as a key that I can then pull down from other applications and things like that. Uh, there's actually a receiver component here in Grasshopper, so we can actually now see that data being reassembled. This is what JSON, uh, IFC looks like formatted in JSON, so it's a whole bunch of objects with nested attributes and relationships and things like that. And if you look closely enough at it, you'd see this is a line starting from uh, a 2D line starting from um, X of minus 1000, Y of 8000 to a X of 9000 and a, a Y of 8000. So. Um, you, you can, in some ways, and again, most people probably don't want to read IFC, but the thing I like about it then is it actually does have um, the ability to audit and, and, and check it as a human, particularly if it is expressed in XML or JSON rather than necessarily the step format, which is typical. So I've, pu I've pushed that data now to that key, and now if I switch to Revit, maybe I'll just quickly start a new project. Um, now what I can do, and again this is still early, so th this is what I would still describe as a proof of concept um, type of demo, but it actually still functions which is quite good. Um, ideally in your Revit project you would say, I've subscribed to these keys and now notify me when any of them get out of date. Okay, and so that's not quite there yet, but what I can basically do as a user is understand that that data changed, and now come and click and say receive speckle. And what that's going to do then is, is pull down that data and create those grids for me here in this project. Now again, it actually should do a better job at notifying me that it added these objects, it modified these objects, it deleted these. So that's another key improvement I need to make. And not just actually for this, but actually just for the normal IFC file transfer. So that's something I'm going to quickly work on. But um, at least it created those objects for me. Now if I'm the engineer and I'm saying, OK, thanks for the grids, I'm going to start modelling some columns on these grids. Um, then I can do that and of course because then the Revit grids get hosted on the grid if I start to move and update and change the positions of the grids the column uh, moves and updates and reflects with that change as part of that operation. Now if I, I, now I'm going back to be, being the architect and setting out this grid and I'm saying I don't like that line A position I'm going to move it and make it go from here to here for example um, and then what that's going to do is push that change and revision to speckle and then now, again, I should have a notification, but that's not implemented yet. But if I say now receive speckle, it's going to bring the updated data into, into Revit and then move those grid positions. Now I'm engineering and I don't like that grid move. I can actually hit Control Z and it will undo that change. Um, and I can carry on working and get on the phone to the architect and say, why did you move that grid? Um, or hopefully resolve that issue in a nice way. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the uh, and again, maybe it's not a global undo. This actually could be bi-directional. So if the engineer moves the grid, it, it wouldn't then, it would be quite difficult because of Grasshopper's a logical programming language to take that grid move and enable that back into the Grasshopper definition. But I actually think this is a better copy monitor than what Autodesk provide. And it could be just you have a Revit project, which is a set out project, and you literally stream the grids and the levels or other objects and things like that from there. Um, and then stream them back into the other projects, including the other consultants models and things like that, um, and, and have that more regularly, more reliably um, manage that change and process. Someone asked me the other day um, when, when I was tweeting about this, um, they would like to rehost. So maybe this grid A becomes grid C, which you just can't do with Copy Monitor. Um, but they're actually with the, the, this technique and strategy, there would be the ability to effectively um, host that now or say this is now that object and then carry on forward um, taking it set out from, from a different, um, different object. So 
I, I really think, and again, I think this is still quite early, and I think it's going to be quite exciting um, to actually work through some use cases and, and, and scenarios of using this as a, a tool and workflow. Have I explained that, or uh, questions on that? Okay. No, well, ideally, actually it will at the moment. So if I actually, oh, I actually haven't tested this, so it's a really good question, but I suspect in, at this point in time, it will break that and we'll end up with grid A and grid B. But what it's actually, what I will make it do is actually store the unique identifier on these objects as well. I just haven't done it for grids yet. And that way then it actually would say, okay, it, it would move and change the tag. Could your other one could do that? That's right. So I just haven't done it for grids yet. I did it for columns and other elements. It's just grids I hadn't done yet. So, and, but that's what I'm saying as well, is you could actually then break the unique identifier or change it so that it actually sourced itself from another object. I guess you just have to be careful. Well, I guess you could have two grids, but then you'd end up with um, two grids over the top of each other um, on that next update. So um, yeah, but so again, this is pretty early, but I think pretty exciting um, a, as a workflow. Other questions? or? Um, you can transmit, I mean again I'm working in progress in doing things, you can transmit things like materials. So I could actually stream the materials to the, uh, to the Revit model. I think even more powerful, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, what would be even more powerful is say streaming the materials and families back to Grasshopper. And, and again because if you're pushing and pulling from a common data source, um, that would actually be quite, quite powerful in terms of coordinating and making sure when you purge a family from your project that you're not using it in Grasshopper, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and just to quickly show, if in this current implementation, so here I have an IPE 300 steel profile. If I send that, the plugin at the moment doesn't really know, would you like a column family or a structural framing family? Maybe it could be a point. I mean, what does a point represent in Revit? I don't really know. Um, and so at the moment, it just tells the user it didn't recognize that particular item. I guess it could have some intelligence built into it. If it can I it can propose some uses of that object that it then lets the user choose. But um, yeah, so I think you know, and again, there is a Dynamo plugin that is being advanced on. So you know, you'll have the options of both. You'll be able to just generate primitive data and and, and transmit that and reassemble it if that's how you prefer to work and and that makes more sense. But what's really exciting to me with Speckle is that within days. Um, we were able to start to transmit more complex objects with other attributes and relationships and things like that and, and actually get them to transmit and solve. So, I mean, this is another example, effectively setting out adaptive components in Grasshopper and then shooting them through Speckle to get them into, into adaptive components in Revit. And again, I'm still enabling them um, on demand, some of these things, but um, yeah, if you have use cases, you want to start testing and trying with these things. Um, I'll, I'll explain how to, how to set it up and use it. Um, and it's pushing other things, not just grids, things like alignments. Um, so taking even, say, a civil 3D for infrastructure projects, setting that out as an alignment and then being able to reference that in Grasshopper and then set out stations or gantries or um, uh, bridges or other, other objects with the features that might exist on, on those types of projects. I'll just quickly race through a couple of other, other things and then I'll... Um, I'll ask if there's any questions or you want me to go through anything in detail but part of this as well talking about Rhino and your BIM toolkit and uh, I don't know if anyone's tried to deliver BIM in Rhino um, I guess it gets a lot more interest most of the BIM still the, the contract are drawings as I sort of mentioned earlier um, and Rhino is not particularly strong at technical drawing um, production so um, including annotation tags and stuff like that. So the, the emphasis on the workflow is typically Rhino slash Grasshopper to Revit. Um, I guess if we get to a model-based delivery, um, that becomes a whole bunch more interesting about putting the attributes on the objects in Rhino and not necessarily worrying about the drawings. The drawings will still have a role, but the tagging and annotating and some of these weak points would not be so um, prevalent. Um, but yeah, you can store, with my w implementation I'm working on, you can store things like um, property sets or parameter sets with groupings as, uh, as user text which you could edit um, using a various number of interfaces in Rhino. There's a whole um, implementation I'm doing about how do you classify objects. So if you select an, a layer and then you can say that all these objects are walls that are a standard wall or a stair that's a, a scissor flight or you know, there's a, this is IFC and there's a whole bunch of um, identified classification um, including predefined types 
uh, as concepts, which then effectively I've been mapping into Revit equivalents and others have been doing similar workflows and things like that. But you know, then you start to get a, a Rhino model with geometry, but with a lot more metadata and, and uh, classification on it, which starts to make Rhino a much more um, powerful BIM tool. I put up this wish list that the shape to fabrication and most of the McNeil guys started to stop talking to me, but um, um, I, I don't know. I was trying to, and, but not really. They they um, they were making a bit of a joke about it, but um, you know, there's a few concepts that I think would make Rhino a much more powerful BIM tool for anyone looking to do BIM in Rhino. Parametric blocks, the equivalent of maybe flexing a family, um, would certainly be a pretty powerful feature to add to a Rhino. Um, the concept of having types which have common attributes, not having to express that across multitudes of ind individual elements and then um, maybe not maintaining them too accurately. Technical drawing production, as I mentioned, might or might not be important for some period of time. Um, concepts such as levels and grids and floors, maybe they could be basic objects that could be added to, to, to uh, base Rhino. And even working with base points and things like that would help, particularly Rhino struggles like Revit does when the model becomes um, remote with meshing and, and displaying geometry and things like that. Um, look, primarily, I guess, I mean, I don't want to speak too long anyway because you'll forget everything I said in the first five minutes, but um, if there's one message to take away, it's hopefully if you're looking at tracing models, um, look at my tools or contact me or contact Ed and, and some of the other guys that are front and a few other guys that have been using the tools in house here. Maybe it's worth you following up with a presentation about some of the projects you've used these tools on in house. Um, but yeah, look, if you're looking at tracing, we, no one loves tracing models, um, coordinating changes through them. Um, so if you want to talk to these guys or me about strategies and, and tools, and they're not necessarily just my tools, as I said, notice there's a whole bunch of of plugins built um, on top of Rhino, um, then please get in contact. Um, and you know, um, I'd be more than happy to try and help out. So, um, effectively, unless I mean, I'm happy to go th through things with more detail. If anyone's got questions, I can stick around a little bit if you have a very project-specific question. But otherwise, um, thanks a lot to all you guys for coming. Hopefully, it was of interest of some some degree. And yeah, if you do uh, do have an opportunity to try and test it and use it, then then I look forward to trying to help you do that. So. Thank you. Thank you so much.